Well, I'm looking forward to bringing this to you this, this year because we're actually making a cornfield here. It's about an acre that we can carve out, literally carve out. It's not in the best of shape right now, but I know that we can make a good food plot and we're gonna put corn in it right away. So I'm gonna explain to you how to do that here, why we're doing it, and uh, hopefully you can take that home and, and maybe give you some inspiration because it doesn't really take that much to get a good cor cornfield in here. And what's cool is we were just, just pulled up and it's an area I told Dylan, I'm like, look around for some sheds because my son Sam was with me. We found a shed right over here and we actually had one hanging in a tree and then another one just passed it. So I'm not sure if these are matching or not. They look similar age, similar diameter. It's just a little bit goofy shaped, but they're, they're pretty close though. So, so pretty cool. The bottom line is we're gonna turn this brush here into a, into a cornfield. The reason we're doing that is Jim is right up there. He's somebody who lives on the property in a camper and we allow him to camp here basically. He signs a camp lease. He's been here for like 18 years in the area. So we don't wanna kick him off. It's a cornfield. We can go by out here. I have lots of switchgrass coming in out here. We have lots of brush. You see this brush line behind me right here? We can walk by there and not spook deer out here. Plus it's corn. If they're in the middle of the corn, they can't see out. Plus we have brush. So we have good screening. We have even good screening on the top side where we actually walk by up top. So we'll be able to hide this cornfield. We have big green plots over there, four or 500 yards, 600 yards. We have a water hole in between. And then we have a big green plot over there five, 600 yards away with a bedding area and another watering hole. So those water holes are about four or 500 yards apart. They're in different movements. We can hunt them with different winds. And then this extends into a bench bedding area similar to this in front of the Kubota. And I, I parked the, the Kubota here for reference because all these trees that you see right here, before it drops off, we're gonna leave a buffer because I don't want erosion, but we're gonna cut these trees out. So all these trees in here, these ash and aspen and garbage and cherry, that are coming in, we're going to cut these out, all early successional growth trees. Even have a red osier dogwood back there, as much as it pains me, it's in my cornfield. So we have a red cedar tree that I love back there, but uh, it's in the cornfield. So we don't want trees growing in the cornfield. We wanna get the maximum amount of tonnage and yield in this corn. So with the green there, the green there, we have corn here. What's nice about this is the corn really starts to pick up the use of it mid-November, end of November into December. So we can look to hold deer. You can bet we'll find more of these sheds in this area when we have the cornfield. This complements the entire movement. So with the green, green corn, bedding areas, water holes, it just creates this entire movement. It creates multiple stand locations. It's something we can walk by, not spook deer in. Jim never comes out of his camper and goes back in here at all. So we don't have to worry about that. We can walk by, we have layers of gray dogwood, briars, brush, switchgrass, we can get around this. In fact, our access is approximately 100 yards from here. So we're leaving a really big buffer so we can hide this in. So that's why it fits in here. It's interesting, you look in this ash right here, you can actually see the emerald ash borer is already taking out these trees. See that little D hole where the ash borer bores into the tree and kills this? So this ash will be dead by next year. We're gonna actually kill it. You can see a cherry over here. You just all this early successional growth. So it's too bad that some of these are dying, but we're gonna take them out anyways. And again, we'll have a really nice buffer. The sunlight is coming in through this range. So we'll get full sun out here. And let's keep walking this way. I'll start, I'll show some of the details of this. So what we're doing is we have a mix of briars, gray dogwood, trees, all kinds of early successional growth, even some cedars mixed in. And then we have goldenrod various weeds and our first step is to remove these big trees so Dante will come in here I'll cut the trees he'll help move them. maybe we'll get one of his friends to help out too uh, Dane maybe you'll come over Gunner maybe we can even get Gunner to come over here he started working on property physical work back in 2017 but now he's filming with Dylan so maybe he's too high up on the food chain now to actually do come out and do labor and, and manual work Gunner, I don't really know. But either way, we'll get some help um, for clearing this. Then the next step, these briars and all this early successional growth. Sorry, I'm looking around for sheds as I'm talking here, but we'll come into this early successional growth and just brush hog it all out. So that'll happen pretty quick. By mid-May, you start to see we're getting a little bit of green up here. It's real early, it's end of April still. Real early in the green up phase, but it's late for spring. 
we've had a really cold spring. We're looking at, I think it's supposed to be a low of 28 tonight. So it's really slowing that green up from taking place. You can see there's no leaves on the trees. The buds are starting to get big. So I have plenty of time until about two weeks from now where I can grind all this out. That good green growth is coming out. There's a lot of movement in all these plants and briars. That's a good time to kill them. So that first thing I'm gonna do here is end of May and then middle of May, uh, end of April and then fast forward to middle of May. So I'm gonna come in here after everything's cleared and we've actually lined out this plot as far as we're gonna make it. In fact, we're gonna have a switchgrass border up here next year. We have gray dogwood right now. So I'll clear up to the portions around Jim's camper all along in here. Then I'm gonna plant switchgrass in next year and we'll plant that. We might use uh, John's HD screening blend this mix just to give us a little bit of a buffer excuse me, up here on this top side. I'll spray a mix of 2,4-D and Roundup. That's a pretty lethal mix that will kill, really focus on the broad leaves in here, and also the grasses will get a really good kill. That'll be mid-May. Mid-June, I'll have Brandon from First Choice Food Plots come in here. He's got a good corn planter with some down pressure. So he'll be able to cut through the sod base in here. And really, when you look at it, the soil's right there. You can, talk, you can take a field like this that hasn't been planted or worked or used for... 15, 18 years, and the soil's still right there. You think about all this debris just adding up, it doesn't add up that fast. So he'll be able to plant in here, and at the same time, we'll spray glyphosate. So we'll get a good spraying, a second spraying of glyphosate, everything will be clear. And then with that corn, I'll be able to come in here and spray it around mid-July, end of July, and get another kill with the glyphosate. So we're gonna effectively control weeds, because if we're not controlling weeds, why even have a food plot? The corn is a great fit here. It complements everything we're doing on the property. And you can see down to the tree line, that's about where we'll clear this corn plot to. So we're getting a really good width right through here. And we're taking, we're using some space that otherwise wouldn't be used. And it's a nice little corner right here. Everything behind here, we're making bedding area. We used to access in the back side of here. We have other access plans for getting down into our, this portion of the property. We won't need to use that anymore, so that becomes all bedding. We already made a bedding ridge over there. So all these pieces are coming together. We have a Habitat Day, June 11th, for Camp Kicking Bear. It's a charity event. We did that last year. We've done charity events for Camp Kicking Bear. This will be the fourth year now. And Chris B is supposed to be involved. Kevin Smith might even have Gary Suter. He's an NHL Hall of Famer. He might be around too for you to greet. But 50 people will pay the fee to come out here for the Habitat event. And this collection of habitat features right here is something I really want to illustrate in June and show how it all comes together. This will be just about planted by then. I don't know if Brandon will be out by then, but we'll have it killed about a month prior. It'll be ready to plant, and so we'll see where it's at. So bottom line is we'll flip back to this and show you what it looks like in the fall, what it looks like from the air and how we transform this jump, junk field pretty quick. And if we didn't plant corn, it wouldn't matter. We would still take the same steps to clear this, spray it. We'd spray it again in mid-June. We'd spray it again the end of July. And then I'd actually throw a seed on the ground. We'd have a great food plot here, just like the logging plot over here. We call it Leo's plot over here. Lucky's where the blind is, where Leo missed Lucky last year. And a lot of the other food plots out here that take place in that first step. The brush hog is a great addition because before, uh, back in the 67, I gro drove through clusters of gray dogwood like this spring, 2,4-D and Roundup a couple times, months apart to kill it and just let it die and rot. We actually had brassica growing in the dead, the dead gray dogwood last year. This is pretty thick though. So instead of driving over with ATV side by side and spraying, we'll brush hog it down first. It gives us an advance in that step. And what's cool about that is the brush hog is something that I really can utilize for our trails, for new plots like this on the property to keep things clean. Of course, we use a mid-PTO belly mower around the yard and keep, keep everything looking nice. What's cool about that is you can go to most rental places and they'll rent a small Kubota with a hydrostatic transmission. Very easy to run. You don't have to have the expense of ever even owning one. It'll probably be bigger than the one I have. I have a 24, 24 horse, 48 inch uh, mower deck and brush hog. But bottom line is, very easy to use, very cost effective to rent for the weekend and getting, get a project like this done. And you'll be amazed what it looks like when it comes time for fall, because this will be a beautiful, hopefully standing yellow cornfield. And we'll transfer this junk field into treasure going into this hunting season. It's a great fit, it'll be easy to do, and we can't wait to bring it to you and show it to you. 
and uh, I hope you enjoy the process and it's something that you can apply to your land or some junk parcel that you want to really transform into something special for this fall. Folks, I want to make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.